two weeks after you're conceived, pretty much became a blob. And um, if your mother had taken a pregnancy test, she would have been able to identify that she was pregnant with you. And why have I gone back um, at plus two weeks after you were conceived? It's simply because at that point, your DNA starts to work and creates building blocks of the person you're going to become. And that person that you're going to become is totally different to anybody who has ever been on earth, anybody who will ever be on earth, anybody who is presently on earth. It means each one of us is entirely different. And not only are we different, we have a code, a language encoded into our very beings which says we are different. So from my blood to my tissue to my spit to my tears, you can identify me under a microscope as being different. All right. But that doesn't end there. When you are born, nine months later, you are under the shepherding, custodianship, st stewardship of your parents. And you live in a house, within a community, within a country, or within a region, within a country, on a continent. And every single one of those ingredients will shape how you see the world, your perceptions and your perspectives. Add on to that, there's a socialization process, education, your religion, the music you listen to, what you hear, all of that shapes you to become Amma. And that shaping is a shape in your mind which becomes your story and your story then determines how you interact with the world around you and so your temperament which are genetically pre-programmed two weeks then come to the fore is she quiet is she loud is she flamboyant if she subdued then your parents, are they left or are they right? We know where they are. <laughs> <laughs> then the nation, is it hot or is it cold? Then your school, which region, what languages do you speak? Fast forward, you are now 22 years old and you are leaving home. And you're leaving home with a set of lenses, perspectives. And that is how you interrogate the universe around you. And that lens or perspective comes in two flavors. One is conscious. The other is subconscious, unconscious. And the subconscious will contain about 90%, it's like the bottom of an iceberg, to your 10% conscious. And so your preferences, your likes and dislikes, now come to the fore in how you relate to me and to the public and to the world at large. Those then, shape how you show up and how you show up is predetermined pre-programmed socialization education religion which country you come from nationality all shapes how you show up let me tell you a funny story please do <laughs> one day my father 
and we were in England and my father came over to stay with us and um, he landed in the morning he was very tired he slept I left him went to work came back and this is what he said I'll speak to you then I'll translate it to English next door neighbor no it seems the next door neighbor was sharpening his knife all day long and then I said no he's scraping the wallpaper from the wall <laughs> okay so in Ghana that sound would be sharpening your knife in England, that sound was scraping the wallpaper from the wall. Your perspective. Same sound. Same sound. Same sound. Yeah. But if I hear it, given my background, and yeah. you hear it, given your background. Totally, totally different, different perspectives. Interpretations. Mm. Okay. And it is important that we are aware that we can hear the same thing and translate it into different sounds. And in fact, two weeks ago, the BBC had a program and they asked the question, do we all see color the same? And the answer is no. Apart from being color blind, your two eyes see colors differently. Yes, apparently. So even for the individual, the left and the right eye see the color differently. Okay? So when you take the 33 million people in Ghana, we see and hear things slightly differently. And so it is important that we acknowledge that in our decision making, especially when we have power because we have the capacity to inflict injury on those who may or may not share our views and that is why conscious and unconscious bias is really important oh i love this i love this first question forgive me that i'm taking us all the way to the beginning no problem my first question is about which one holds more sway genetics or socialization which one would you say has more influence on who i am and you know what i am okay as against the other so there's um a lot of studies done but I'm going to quote a guy called Arthur Brooks. He's a Harvard professor. He's written a number of books on um, happiness and mindset and so on. Mm. And he says, and, um, he says that about 40% of who we are is nature. 40%? My goodness, that's a lot. It's nature. 20% we can't do anything about it, add that to it, socialization, etc. The other 40% is a choice. So 40% nature, 20% nature, 40% is a choice. Of course, up until age 21, 22, most of your decisions are made for you. What you wear, what you eat, where you sleep, what toothpaste you use, what deodorant you use. Your parents will buy it for you. Beyond that, you come into your own and you start to build your life. And here, when you're building your life, you have the option to make critical choices. Forgive me that I'm diving into a bit of science no right now. But that 40% nature, I'm guessing that's genetics, mm -hmm. you know, DNA, your parents, yeah. 
things like that. That's that's way more than I, I, I ever give, you know, um, um, credits for. For the, I have always felt that socialization would play more, you know, or would be more instrumental in who a person turns out to be mm. as against, mm. you know, the person. This, this is very informative for me. Mm -hmm. Very informative for me. I see. I see. Let's hold it there. I'm a black man. Right. It means the propensity for sickle cell is high okay um the propensity for skin cancer is low <clears throat> i'm a short man this my ability to run like you say boat it will never happen <clears throat> okay i was born to a, a lawyer father and a curious mother so i'm loquacious i like to talk i don't have a problem there <clears throat> um i'm not shy that is built into my DNA. Um, my metabolism is really fast. It means whatever I eat, I don't put on weight. Mm. I walk fast, I talk fast, I think fast, all of that. And then when you put on choice upon choice and nature upon nature, it means the consequences of my life have partly already been defined <clears throat> for me hmm. I am a black man and therefore quite often I will be lactose intolerant <clears throat> okay I must keep my sugar and my booze and my fat down because I have a propensity to have a heart attack or some other lifestyle disease. All of those play a part. And those are predetermined. Those ones and are those completely are out of your hands. Okay. Yes. Now let's come to the ones that are you know, in your hands. Yes. Just be 40%. Yes. And I find it interesting that even under socialization, there's the, the ones that you have control over mm -hmm. and then there's just what you don't have control yeah. over. Let's talk about the 20%. So the 20% is you're growing up, you've been groomed. Look, if I was born in Iran, the likelihood would be that I'll be a Shia Muslim. If I was born in Saudi, I'll be a, a Sunni Muslim. If I was born in certain parts of India, I'll be a Hindu I'll be a Buddhist. Hindus don't eat a meat. Muslims don't eat pork. Um, if you're a vegetarian, you might avoid flesh. Mm. If you're a vegan, you might avoid everything. Yes. Do you see what I mean? So already you are making critical choices which uh, compound over time. If, I'm, if I live in a rural area, the likelihood is I will eat a lot of greens and very little fish and or red meat. And that will have a compound effect, positive or negative. This week, the economists have released uh, an obesity index. All right? And the obesity index is showing where people have either uh, predisposed or have overeaten and therefore in America as much as about 30% are supposed to be obese. That's a problem. And obesity will be a genetic factor which affects the children that you give birth to. In terms of the propensity to so when you go to the hospital they ask you do you have any um uh, glycoma in your family heart disease in your family Diabetes. because it is flowing through genetically right okay but you can change your genetics by what you eat by what you drink by um how much sleep you have it changes what they call the circadian biorhythms 
how we respond to light in the morning and in the night. And that will change your makeup. So what you eat today will affect the children you have tomorrow. Absolutely. I mean, I've heard, you know, things being said. So, so for instance, there are some places you go to and the people there are predominantly really, really tall. Yes. Or lanky. We are told that sometimes it's what they eat. Yes. Or what they drink. I've mm -hmm. been told yams, for instance, mm -hmm. are very, you know, instrumental, perhaps even in having twins mm -hmm. and things like that. And sometimes it's just because where you find yourself, yams grow better. Yeah. Simply that, just the geographical location in mm -hmm. which you find yourself. That's very interesting. Yeah. That's very interesting. So there's 20% of you, that socialization, mm. you really have no control over. That affects who you are. So mm. how many Catholics do you see becoming Muslims? How many Muslims do you see becoming Catholics? Mm. Do you see what I mean? So this is having gone past age 21, 22, you still find that we are creatures of habit. We are creatures of socialization. Somebody will tell you, where the minimum deal, I don't eat that. I don't know how to eat that. Forgetting that when they were two or three, they had to learn to eat everything. Culturally, we don't do this or we don't do that. Mm. Okay. And then, of course, you have the 40%. Right. Which for me would be the most interesting. Yes. I love the things that I have control over. Yes. So let's talk about that 40% so that I can control. So the 40% is first of all being conscious that there are inherent biases and knowing that you are influenced for better or for worse by those biases and then making a choice or a stand to move west or east in terms of do I add to those biases or do I walk away from those biases? Let me give you a classic example in Ghana. Most Ghanaian women, in fact, black women for, for that matter, when you ask them, um, uh, uh, would you have a relationship with a white man? Immediately, there is a preference which says, no, and I don't understand because the white man functions like a black man. The only difference might be the color of his skin and his culture. But the immediate response is, no, I prefer a black man. I, I don't get it. I, I really don't get it. But it is a socialization process which subliminally, subconsciously says, I prefer a black man to a white man or a white man to a black man. I'm only raising this issue because of the gender split in Ghana. We have 54 women to 46% men. So there's always going to be a gap. Okay? And the eight, the eight percent will need to go and find husband somewhere. <laughs> so my sisters, this is what I mean. Okay, that there is a bias, and that bias is an unconscious bias. I mean, you want to stick with what you know. You want to stick with your own. Stick with what you know. And and that's the conversation for today. But, That's the conversation. But sticking with what you know, Henry Ford says, if I had asked my customers what they wanted, they would have asked for a faster horse because they didn't know about a car. Right. Okay. So this then says, I need to be curious enough to explore beyond the confines of my village. Otherwise, you'll be like a conco and you'll be stuck in your village and you see a bicycle and you call it an iron horse. I love a conco, by the way. <laughs> <laughs> oh, so do I. So do I. I love a conco. I love Chinachibi. Yeah. I so, have to say. So, yeah. 
it is important that we are conscious of the conscious and unconscious bias mm. and then we can begin to make um, proper decisions now Daniel Kahneman wrote a book called um, thinking fast and slow and he talks about system one and system two thinking and system one thinking is our immediate emotional response and system two thinking is our latent rational response now let me take you back to week two when you are conceived mm. the reason i'm doing that is because we were emotional before we became rational so emotions kicking faster than rationality okay and that is important because if you're given to react to a certain scenario often the subconscious which is system one which is the emotional will kick in and then much much later system two which is the rational will kick in so you walk into a room i'm interviewing five people two of them are women and the two women look absolutely gorgeous and two of them have just come from england and the three are guys and they haven't gone anywhere and um, they are okay immediately my predisposition is to the beautiful woman women add on that they have lived in england and, exposed. and supposedly are more exposed so speak like me and immediately i identify with them and they have the benefit of what we call the halo effect mm. a positive bias for them and they get hired unconsciously i have chosen them because they sound like me they flow with me and so i choose them wrong because the three other people in the room might be more qualified and temperamentally might be better personality wise because we are looking for diversity of thought and action in the room hmm. as you are speaking I, I i hope you can see how broad my smile is because i'm one person who constantly says to women there's nothing wrong with being emotional right because it's the one criticism that is always leveled against mm -hmm. women like mm -hmm. women are more emotional that we tend to take decisions based on, and i've always said that it's valid it's valid it's valid mm -hmm. but as you are speaking i realize and i recognize perhaps the criticism which is that that's your first reaction mm -hmm. you need to calm down mm -hmm. you know and perhaps be more logical mm -hmm. and think to you know i'm not saying that i'm changing my <laughs> <laughs> my stand that being emotional is okay and it's valid but there is a place for being a whole i mean more what's the way i'm not i don't want to use the logical is the word. thank you thank you thank you right there's 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 definitely a place for that but you can understand our difficulties and there's one thing i say about religion all the time and i get you know i get people look at me funny because really really all of us are what we are because of geography our parents you know i'm christian because it's it's that basic mm. if i were born somewhere else mm. like i have muslim friends mm. and they are muslim because mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. you know what i'm saying yeah and at the end of the day my question has always been so god for, for the christian god is going to eliminate because we speak about fire mm. right burning non-christians mm. eliminate all of these people and kill all of these people because they made a choice through no fault of theirs no they didn't make the choice at all that choice right? was predetermined for them before they could even in Acts chapter 17 verse right. 25 he is the god who chooses the times and places where men should live so even where you live is predetermined if you're taking the christian narrative but let's not go there let's not go there that, that, that's, that's a heavy one yes. because then i say that 
we have to be tolerant of other religions. The yeah. thing where you say mine is the only way or mine is... We, we, we have to examine that. But let me be clear. All religions are exclusivist. All religions. Even the inclusivist religion like um, uh, 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 the church unification church of uh, South Korea is exclusivist because there is an element which says even the Baha'i religion that says that this is the religion otherwise you will exclude yourself out if you say uh, Christianity is okay and the Baha'i religion is okay then you don't need the Baha'i religion because Christian is okay do you see what I mean yeah. unless you're saying all paths lead to the same place but where I want to take you is this uh, and, and I want to take you back a bit when you say we say women are emotional everybody is emotional <laughs> it is how you articulate communicate your emotions some people get angry and they are quiet some people get angry and they are loud some people get happy and they are reserved some people get happy and they are loud so it is how demonstrative one is not that the person is or isn't emotional you cannot excuse me avoid being emotional but what you do is you how you communicate those emotions is what might be at the issue here hmm. what you do with the emotion what you what do, you do with, with the that emotion because when you take um i mean i have a framework a basic framework called mm -hmm. idea information definition emotions and actions mm -hmm. and so once the information comes in you define it good or bad immediately there is an emotional response about 10 hours later there's a rational response too late <laughs> but then you take action based on the emotional response and the issue at hand is what action should i take when there is an emotional uh, response mm. you see and often if the matter becomes a little bit heated when you feel not think you feel emotion again that you're being taken advantage of because you're a woman if i were a man they wouldn't say this if i were a man they wouldn't do this and that then stokes your ire inflames you passionately and you say i need to do this thing to let them know that you can't do this to me because i am a woman but that's the narrative that is the framing you have framed it to say they are doing it because i am a woman or black or black or short or handsome or beautiful okay so because of biases some people a have privilege and some people reap a dividend hmm. let me quote warren buffett he says i won the genetic lottery my father was an investment banker so hmm. guess what he's an investment banker too i won the genetic lottery my father was a lawyer guess what you end up being a lawyer okay so that goes into your biasing the critical bit is to know and do something about that knowledge that we all have biases and we need to address those biases okay so that we don't end up allowing people to win or have a dividend which is not deserved hmm. i like this now i want us to look at it both ways and then we come to improving diversity and tolerance i want us to conclude on biases i mean as a beautiful woman you mm. have won the genetic lotion Charlie. like 
actually you know what i'm saying yeah. <laughs> yeah. as a strong man right yeah you have won the genetic as a short man <laughs> You have lost the genetic. No, Amen. <laughs> oh no, actually, it's not true because yes. uh, uh, Amen. Yeah, 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 because uh, right now it looks like the shorter men are uh, winning. Are winning. And a man they are like, winning. Uh, <laughs> the shorter men are winning. Fellow <laughs> Right. So, I mean, it, it works both ways. Yeah. You could win the genetic lottery, you could lose it. And, and, and what do you do with it when you know it? Be I'm saying this because there are instances where, and let me go to the example that you gave about the interview. So, because you look better and perhaps sound a certain way, you will have a foot in the door. Totally. Which, which is awesome. Totally. So, I mean... Which is what I say to young girls all the time. Then what you do with that is that you make sure that once you get inside that door, you keep it going. Yeah. You, you you operate at that level. Yeah. You do not disappoint. Mm. You have some brains, mm. you know, that would match you know, because it's an advantage. Yeah. Okay. So so there's that. Mm -hmm. And then there's the other side of where perhaps you just don't look good enough. Mm -hmm. Maybe you have some strange mm -hmm. features yeah yeah it might not be bad but when you put them together it's a, you understand what i'm saying yeah. i mean how do you navigate whichever side you fall on such that it becomes an advantage okay so and that's why i started off at two weeks on conception because there's only one you hmm. there is only one you and so Instead of being a fake somebody, be an optimized you. And you become a monopoly. And what you do with monopolies, you exploit your monopoly. So what is the one or what are the two things that only you can do? And it means you find it, you become world class at it, then you become undeniable. Because... You, you found it, you become world class, you are solving a problem. You are offering a solution. And so, yes, the person who's won the genetic lottery has won the genetic lottery. No doubt about it at all. It is up to you to communicate your value that you bring mm. to a given situation. I'm a black man, I'm a short man, I live in Africa. But I make no bones about the fact that if you put me on the global stage for leadership, governance, and strategy, I have no equals. Hmm. And if I have equals, they are equals. And, I, you know, I am primus inter pares. I am first amongst many equals, or I sit amongst equals. No bones at all. I live in Ghana. But I am confident that it doesn't matter where you come from, east, west, south, or north. When it comes to strategy, when it comes to leadership, when it comes to governance, I am it. Because I have sought to make myself it. I have schooled myself. I mean, I can do nothing about my skin, nor can I do anything about my height but I can grow my intellect to a, you know, a huge size so that I can make a contribution. And that is really important. Hmm. So whether you're tall or short can be an advantage. If you're shooting a movie about planet of the midgets, if you're tall, it's no advantage at all. Zero. If they're shooting a movie about Yasantwa, if you're a, a, a white woman, it's no advantage to you at all. So, how do I exploit the gifts that have been given to me? Knowing that some people, they are just blessed. Blessed because who born them? Blessed because where they were born? 
blessed because which school they went to bless 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 but me too i am blessed because there's only one me hmm. i love this yeah i love this i used to say that the most beautiful and most handsome people normally simply just lack personality <laughs> I'm going up to know that it's a bias and it's often not true. Mm. But, you know, growing up, I, when somebody is extremely good looking, you need to give me way more. Mm. Because I, I realize that it gets them you through, know, the through the door. So they don't have to work on other mm. aspects mm. of who they are or mm. who they can be. Mm. So I absolutely love what you say about knowing yourself and maximizing your strengths. Beautiful answer. Now let's come to improving diversity and tolerance with bias at the back of our minds really important you know when um, a few years ago when Tony Blair and George Bush decided they wanted to evade invade Iraq mm. there were maybe one or two voices in the room that said hold on a minute I think Colin Powell was one of them. Mm. But Condoleezza Rice uh, and the rest were hawkish about going into Iraq to the extent that when Tony Blair came to Parliament in England, he told us that um, Saddam Hussein has weapons of mass destruction and that within 30 minutes he could launch. One person in his cabinet resigned because they didn't agree with the judgment that was being made. Another person, Professor Kelly, also leaked information to the Guardian newspaper to say what Tony Blair was saying was not true. But the vast majority of people in cabinet and in parliament swallowed what Tony Blair said line hook and sinker and ignored the millions of people who marched around the world i was in los angeles at that time they were marching not in our name no for war in london they were marching not in our name no for war years later we discover there were no weapons of mass destruction mm. and do you know what was critical the criticality was the lack of diversity of thought in the room what you had was a collective mindset or group think and group think will kill you group think will kill you all right and so it is important if you don't have negative voices in a room and you're taking major decisions that you put in a structure to do exactly that. Christine Lagarde stood up when we had the uh, world crisis, banking crisis, and said, if we had had more women in the bank king sector or on the boards, we would not have had this disaster. Let me take you back to the 6th of October, 1973. Israel woke up to find that there was a war between them and Egypt. And so Israel said, never again shall we be caught unaware. And so they developed something called red teaming. Hmm. So that in any room discussion, at least 10 or 20% in that room will be the red team. And they will be the non-conformists, the doubters, the skeptics, in the room otherwise known as devil's advocate mm. 
So if you don't have diversity, then you must create artificial diversity because having diversity of thought is important. It adds about 30 to 40 percent profitability in a discussion. And so where do we find the diversity? We find diversity in gender. In Ghana, you have 54 percent women, 46 percent men. And my understanding, uh, an understanding I got um, this week is that the number of women parliamentarians will be fewer in the next one than in this one. How come? Ridiculously reduced. How come? How come? All right? Across the globe, um, SP uh, 100-500 board uh, CEOs Zilcho, you know, you can count them on your hand. Board directors, you have a portion. 14 to 20%. Mm. That means the scope and the scale of nuanced talk is limited. Mm. Okay, if you have an old school boy network, everybody sees yellow. Everybody thinks yellow, delivers yellow. You need different colors in the room. Gender, religion, age, etc. To have a more balanced, nuanced conversation. Otherwise, it will be skewed. And the outcomes will not be optimal right. because you're only hearing from one, one dimensional one conversation one voice okay so increasingly esg environmental social and governance has been a tag that has uh, uh, become a requirement for a lot of multinational businesses simply so that we can have greater diversity in the boardroom hmm. on the board but please don't get me wrong because if you skew it the other way and you have an all-female organization hmm. then it's the same problem then you will right. have the same problem right. and i have taken issue against a certain organization that has done that and i've had the response from the hr director saying Theodore, we are seeking to address that. But I'm not sure they are doing that quickly enough. And you know who you are. <laughs> quickly enough. I will not mention your name. Quickly enough. Mm -hmm. I think you've made the points brilliantly for representation. You know, which is for me yes. what this is. You've made, you've made a brilliant point for representation. Because it's about other perspectives. Yes. Simple. Simple. It's about other perspectives. And it's important to have... A, a, a wholesome, holistic, um, what's it called? Uh, 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 perspective. Yeah, perspective. Perspective, perspective. Mm. Okay. Tolerance. So, if you're going to accept diversity, then the other side of the coin is that you are acknowledging that we are not all the same. And if we are not all the same, then you are also acknowledging that in some instances, we will need to make modifications or allowances for those who are not like us. Okay. And to be very clear, this is a thorny area when you come to, for example, um, if we're going to redress the balance of representation, should we have a quota system? 
and if so for how long and what would be the criteria are we going to lower the standards and have affirmative action so we need to be careful sometimes the gate is too high for the short people to climb over but be beyond height are there other qualities that you can use as criteria for selection what is the height of a man got to do with him being a pilot of a plane and yet when i was growing up you needed to be five feet seven inches tall for a man to be a pilot a commercial airline pilot and i think an air force pilot all right isn't it the same brain please do you understand me absolutely okay what does your gender have to do with being a lawyer zero what does your gender have to do with being a parliamentarian zero so how is it that we are having reduced numbers of females in the next parliament how do we address that imbalance quota affirmative action question mark mm. some of us are not so fortunate and we have some me uh, some disability do we make room for that if so how so how so really important women unfortunately men cannot give birth so only women can give birth how do we make adjustments in the workplace in terms of leave everybody was born of a mother hmm. do we make adjustments how do we make the adjustments and for how long and for what please do you understand absolutely me? okay so a man is a man and a woman is a woman and never the the two will meet you accept who they are who he is who she is and then address the critical issue of bringing about a balance which allows for equity so you accept that generally a man will be stronger than a woman generally a woman will be uh, more nurturing than, than a man mm. those come in, with a package mm. but we need to make allowances for the package that is delivered that is you and that is me wow 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 another very informative session very informative session there are so many other angles we could have taken this but um time will not uh, permit us there's, there's a very um um topical issue in ghana right now that i wish we could have but it's okay i think the message has gone down you know um the the, the appreciation of our bias the diversity why it's important why listening to other voices is important why other opinions being on around the table is important but ultimately why tolerance of others of other viewpoints of other you know what's other than us is necessary for optimized mm. living mm. optimized living did i summarize properly perfectly let me just add one right. coda you know during the second world war <clears throat> Um, Hitler drove Jews and Jewish scientists and academics out of Germany mm. and they were instrumental in building the atomic bomb 
So he let go of the very intelligentsia that could have helped him to build and sustain his nation. Any community, country or company which ignores a significant percentage of its constituency is bound to be sub-optimized in its outcomes. Hmm. Hmm. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. So this goes beyond self. This goes directly to corporates mm. and therefore nation building. Yes. Nation building. Thank you so much. Thank, Thank you so much. Uh, yes. Another amazing informative um, session. I hope that you listened. I hope that like me, you made a lot of notes. I hope that you appreciate, you know, your composition in terms of what makes you and you understand you know that some of the biases that you have perhaps you really have no control over but then you also have an appreciation of what that means for diversity what tolerance means for your person and subsequently for building this nation and perhaps another nation for building the world and making the world a beautiful 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 place they would have to be right back ha yeah we And that was an amazing conversation, an insightful one, of course, with Amma Pratt and lawyer Albright on unveiling the biases with regards to improving diversity and tolerance. My name is Ohima Echaji Kum, and you're still watching The Couch with Amma Pratt. I am taking over the second leg of the show, and we are going to espouse a conversation on the topic of marriage. When we hear about marriage, is it about the glitty, glamorous weddings, or is it about the jollof someone is going to eat at your wedding? Or is it about just two people catching a vibe, you know, feeling that butterfly in their tummy and wanting to come together for the rest of their lives? I've got season aspects to speak to us on the issue or the topic of my marriage. No, it can't be an issue, can it? <laughs> it can't be an issue, the topic of marriage. I have here with me um, a lawyer. Uh, we are going to look at it from the legal uh, standpoint. We are also going to listen to the wise counsel of a marriage aspect. And we are also going to take, uh, you know, a casual look at the medical insight of marriage. Good evening. Good evening. It's good to have all of you here. Mm -hmm. So Thank I'm going you. to introduce, um, it, it would have been ladies first. But <laughs> since he's the only gentleman, please allow me ladies. Let's pamper him. <laughs> Good evening, Sam. Good evening. So uh, you are a medical scientist yes. and you are in the person of Isaiah yes, Ahim. Yes, yes. And today you're going to educate us. Yeah, are you excited? Very much, very much. Okay. Thank you for having me. All right, you're welcome. Yeah. And moving on to the known face. We all know you, you are auntie. Yeah. And are you happy to be here? <laughs> Very. Seeing the two of them, my... Your people. Yeah. So I'm really happy. <laughs> Especially lawyer. It's been a while. Yeah. So yeah. <laughs> she is counselor perfect. Yeah. Perfect. Yeah. You're perfect a counselor. Is my name. Yes. But like technically, you're a counselor and you're perfect. <laughs> it's a I'll take that. Yes. Yeah. <laughs> Thank you. I'll take that. Thank you. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And also... Uh, we've had so much fun in the studio before we are coming live here. I've learned so much even before um, my producer says, you know, action. She is lawyer Annie Fiao. And uh, I can't wait to delve into the conversation with you. Thank you and welcome Thank to you the couch. Too. All right. So this afternoon, we are just going to espouse the conversation on marriage. I'll begin with um, Councillor Perfect. Counselor, you you are well endowed when it comes to the issue of marriage or the topic of marriage. Why do I keep saying issue? <laughs> marriage is not an issue, is it? Um, the, the topic of marriage. You know, um, in this day and age, it's we only see the social media glitz, glamour, 
we only see it as some sort of social validity where people want to be seen in their nicest wedding gowns Ooh. and now even the the usual kente fabric has yeah. been modernized yes. and remodeled yeah. into you know fashion high fashion yeah, you glitter know, and glamour. styles and tell us what is marriage thank Simply, you that'll be briefly because i know you've been talking about yeah. that <laughs> um, almost all the time on the show yes yeah so wait my side counseling psychology marriage relationship family therapy when we talk about marriage we are talking about a matured individual 18 years and above right maturity in body wise and mental agreeing to marry a man you understand we are talking about we are not talking about the same sex mm. so a man and a woman who are matured coming together mm to perform the necessary rights and live as husband and wife right that is marriage to us right but this evening we want to understand i earlier mentioned some of the things we see when the topic of marriage is mentioned now did we know that you have to prepare for marriage did we know because until um, you are married, you wouldn't know what's in there. For someone, for me, I'm not married yet. <laughs> but then, you know, we, we have that superficial knowledge of mm. meeting someone, as you say, mature. You think, okay, this person has a good career. This person does this. Lawyer was saying earlier that, oh, he's a doctor, he's a lawyer. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Forget it. You're going to have maybe bright or intelligent children. But then there are preparations to marry. Yeah. There are things you have to put in place before you get married. What are some of the things in your in your view should we do when we are ready to get married? First of all, to get married, you yourself, you need to prepare. Mm. So you must know who you are. Mm. You must be able to explain to somebody who you stand for. So Councillor Perfect, I'm... Um, I'm, I'm supposed to know my temperament, mm. what works for me, what is my passion, my vision, all that. Put all these things in check. You must be able to know your financial strength. Mm. It's very important because you are going in to take responsibility of another person. Say, if we're a man, society holds on you that you are going to take care of the lady she will get pregnant you need to take care of the child family members one or two things so you must be able to take care of yourself um feed uh, two or three mouths in inclusive mm -hmm. if we're lady to we are in an era that is not only the man who brings financial um gains to mm -hmm. the home so you are also gainfully employed you have a skill mm -hmm. You have something doing, mm. something that at least can end you money. Right. And I always say this, if you want to get mar married as a woman, be financially independent of yourself because it gives you power. And one thing is the man will not treat you anyhow. You also have that, that you can do something for yourself. You see, he who controls the pest controls what? The populace. Mm. So if you also go into marriage as a lady, you have something that you are bringing onto the table. Let me say that financially you are capable. You can do that's certain. That's the balance now. Yes, that's, that's the expression. What do you bring, bring. to the table? <laughs> yeah. yeah, something small that you can do. It's helpful, but mm. you have no skill. You have no education. You have nothing. You just want to venture into marriage. That is a suicider for you. Mm. All abuse, it's easy for you to absorb abuse because you have no willpower of your mm. own. Then you must also be psychologically matured mm. enough. You must be emotionally intelligent. So you, you it's not everything. Mar marriage itself is for the matured, as I said earlier yeah. on. So certain things must be able to absorb it. It's not like the small thing you run to your mother, the small thing you run to your pastor and all that. You must know that you are going to live with an imperfect person and you are also imperfect. You must learn to compromise. You must learn to adapt and overlook certain aspects right. your spiritual aspects too you must know that you are capable of yourself we will have a supreme god if we're christian we're muslim because you see when you talk about this fact most people don't pay much attention to it because when you bring a child into the world if you are from two separate um religion, religion how are you going to raise that child mm. you need to know this agree before you venture so get to know all these the fiscal aspects are you okay my doctor will come in to explain further are you as the genotype all these things you need to know 
and physically you must be somebody that you you are you are able or you can perform most um, activities with less assistance meaning that if you are somebody who everything that every activity in the house or every you need major assistance to perform mm -hmm. then marriage will not be that enjoyable to you mm -hmm. you should be able to perform certain activities with less assistance or perform it completely mm -hmm. and knowing that sexually you are okay you can't enter marriage knowing that certain sexual organs of yours is not working. Then you enter into marriage. If you don't consummate it, it's not marriage. Mm. So that one you should know before you enter. Then the aspect of the person you are going in for comes in. So before you enter marriage, know yourself. Because if you don't know yourself, you make a mistake choosing somebody who doesn't fit you. Then you would then focus on the person who can fit me. The vision of the person. So when you start dating, when you start courting, this is where you check the vision, the mission, their spirituality, their finances, if it matches with yours. Then it's a good fit. You can go. We don't have any perfect marriage. We have good fit. You can go. But if you realize that the vision, I want to stay in Ghana and make it. She is always thinking about going to Canada and all that. We can't be. I can't be in a long distance relationship. It's best you drop the person than spend two, three years with them before telling them that I can't be with you. You are wasting the person's time. So these are the things they need to look out for. If you but to. you realize that people are like the ever swaying pendulum. They are just going yeah. and coming as the wind blows it. Some vision, as you have put it, may change uh, along the line. For instance, I want to go study abroad to perhaps further my education or you know see greener pastures while you want to stay in ghana here and then as time goes on when i look at the opportunities that are coming and uh, the growth that we are both enjoying or going through my mind may change what happens to that that is different you see we have core you have your vision mm. then your mission mm. right you have your core what moves you what you are about this is what i want to do you see in management we say that failing to plan is planning to, to fail, fail. Yeah. so you must know that this is where i'm heading so if the person is not heading with me towards this direction then it's a no-no for me mm. or if i can compromise you see some people they come into your life and know that you can i've said it here countless times you can't have 100 percent so sometimes this person takes everything for me and one thing is the physical also so when you are knowing what you want check the physical some people want boobs yeah some people want <laughs> it matters it brings the which one you want as the <laughs> <laughs> which one you want <laughs> I have no problem. Hey, hey! I don't believe that. Doc has a friend. We'll find out. We'll find out. Okay, please carry on. You see, um, it attracts you. Mm. This body, sh he says no preference, mm. but to me, I would say it's but quite. Passively, yes, it's a passive preference. He, 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 he's not willing to tell us maybe he's on show, but there's something that attracts you. Yeah. You see, every man, you see certain types of ladies, they will not attract you. Mm. But one particular type will attract maybe the height, mm. maybe the color, maybe the shape, you understand. And mostly men are attracted to a lady who is having their mother's kind of physique or mm. who is like their mother or their first love. Oh. Yes. It's their mother or the first love. So if you see somebody always wanting slim, 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 maybe it's their mother was like that or the first love. Somebody he was uh, making an idol out of was like that. Mm. So that is what he's visited to. That is what he wants. So the physical also is important because it brings the attraction. Attraction moves to chemistry, the connection. Mm. So that they sustain the marriage. You can't marry somebody who don't have this attraction chemistry bond with. Mm. It becomes boring yeah. and the cheating comes in. So as I was saying, you don't find anybody who is 100%, you get 80. So you realize that maybe the physique, I'm not so much attracted to this person, but how the person is smart, I like Sapisexual, the person is smart, is hardworking, yeah, is God-fearing. I was God -fearing. going to touch on that. Yeah, yeah. God-fearing and all that. Okay, nyash, nyash. Charlie, let me do away and focus on the mind. Mm -hmm. So that is you are compromising and you have accepted of you in yourself that I want the 80, I'm training the 20. Yeah. You have accepted it. So seeing somebody who is having nyash and not no mind or not never attracted you because you have accepted it yourself and you are moving on with it. So you have the compromise and 
that comes along. So it's not straight jacket that this is what I want, so I'm at. But you find people that you realize that they are good, they lack like certain things that I want, but let me compromise because of the other good things that way more than maybe I'm looking at for. Now you talk of personalities. If I am the loud, bubbly, outspoken type, what kind of personality should I be compatible with or am I, um, you know, likely to gel with more? Now you see, we mostly say science says that opposites attract. attract yes. So when you are, what you are saying, you are the sanguine type, mm -hmm. right? We have the alpha, we have the beta, we have all that, the sigma, the a lot going mm -hmm. on. But what we like to deal with is mostly the four broad temperaments that mm -hmm. we know, the sanguine. So if we are sanguine, it's best you go for somebody who is with the other two um, melancholic or phlegmatic. Mm -hmm. You understand? Because they are not that extrovert. Mm. They are introvert. And since you always see the bright side of things, they will rather, you, you talk about the um, uh, phlegmatic, they see things in mostly negative view. So you seeing everything, oh, this business will work. Let me do the insu business it to work and all that. He is going to calculate everything, take because they are analysts. Mm. Analyze everything, tell you that, my dear. This business is good, but it will not be good for you in this location and all that. Mm. So they come in to compliment you. Mm. Then we talk about the choleric person who is like fire, heat. They always tax or rented. They want to do this. They are leaders and all that. So you matching yourself with a choleric, the same person. There's going to be power struggle in the home. Because the wife also wants to lead. You also want to lead. Mm -hmm. But if a sanguine um, choleric person goes with somebody who is um, melancholic and all that, they allow them to lead because melancholic people also want to be sociable. But they can't in of themselves. They feel shy. Mm -hmm. So having a wife who is there being popular and they also following and all that, they are okay with it. Mm -hmm. So the wife can be the leader, be around and all that, and they will be in the shadow and also having the little bit of glory from the um, being out pre uh, celebrated or whatever, they are okay. Mm -hmm. So you must know this and so that you can pair yourself right. Because you realize that if you have two people who are always um, sanguine people, two of them, they are always outward, they are dressing um, flamboyantly, but their house is not in order. Yeah. They can't keep things in order. Everything is messy. And the two of you are like that. It will not be good for parenting. What are you going to teach the children? Mm. Their home will not even be safe for them because the parents don't even stay at home. They are always up and about. They have a lot of friends that they can't even keep um, track on. Every day people are coming in and parenting is not like that. So it's best you know your temperament, know your flaws, know your strength and work on it. You see, marriage is such a way that you go for somebody who is having... Um, your weakness, the person is having strength in it. So where you are weak, they come into some um, supplement. But if you both have weakness in indecisiveness, you make you not make any um, headway. So it's best you know the temperament and to understand that sometimes when your partner is acting out, always being loud and you go out, they leave you around and always greeting people and all that. That is who they are. If you want to control them, they will not be happy. Mm. So just allow them room, but always try to monitor we them, not to be so much. Yeah. Well. Thank you so much, uh, Counselor Perfect. You're still watching The Couch with Amma Pratt, but course i'm sitting in for Amar Pratt and we ha we've had um a great start so far i would say now you were telling us earlier that um people do not understand the relationship between marriage and the law yeah. that it has some legal underpinnings so lawyer annie take us through what is the relationship between marriage and the law all right so to start with, I will say that in as much as people are preparing to be married, you know, we prepare, I say that from my experience so far, the women in particular brides-to-be get so excited and carried away. And we are more prepared for the ceremony, mm. that I call it, mm. than the marriage which actually begins after the ceremony. Now, the marriage and the law have a very, very interesting relationship because in law marriage is a special type of contract i'll put it so it's a contract first because 
two people must have a certain understanding what we will call in law ad idem, ad idem yeah. the meeting of minds right. yeah. so somebody must make a proposal hmm. somebody must say an acceptance. I agree. Offer an acceptance so there is an offer and an <laughs> yeah, acceptance yeah, yeah, yeah. but it's special in itself so not again like the usual commercial contract because this one confers a certain status mm. in law that comes with peculiar implications for the journey so marriage and the law the relationship is so interesting so yes when we take out the counseling the psychological bits medical bits spiritual aspects one aspect that i think a lot of people have not really averted their minds to mm. what are the legal implications of this journey i am embarking on because before you were ama you were kofi we are moving when we meet we meet as friends even if it's friends with benefits people say there'll be no strings attached mm. as far as the law is concerned even concubinage has never translated into the status that the law the lenses through which the law sees marriage mm. so when you're looking at marriage you first ask yourself this marriage i'm going into what is the law saying about it and for me where you even need to begin from is what type of marriage are you entering into because the type of marriage you're entering into will begin to give you an idea exactly what the law is also looking at the lenses through which the law is perceiving what you're entering so in law and legally in our jurisdiction in ghana we recognize only three types of marriages in our jurisdiction so we are looking at the first type which is what is customary marriage and I'm happy that we have this platform today as we have this conversation to put out a very, very important education. Mm -hmm. Now, I think that we have reduced customary marriage to the point where we are all calling it engagement. engagement yes. But <laughs> in our jurisdiction here, what is called engagement out there is not what we are doing here. Yeah. What we do here, where families come together actually present a list mm. for the kind of items they're receiving our viewers should understand in Ghana this is marriage this is our marriage. it is customary yeah. marriage mm. engagement is what the two of you have stood in your own corner alone and said I love you and they've given you a promise ring and you're showing it on social media that is engagement but as far as we are concerned under our laws the moment two families have come together somebody has given a list this is what I'm giving you you are paying bride price. You are bringing six pieces of cloth. Maybe you are bringing cows. Now, it's marriage. So, for me, this is important because it looks like a number of people are not satisfied with this level of the marriage. Mm -hmm. In their minds, is an engagement. So, the law guarantees them nothing. No. This is marriage. Mm -hmm. Now, the only thing is that the essentials of this marriage, the incidents of this marriage varies across culture so in some culture we are only taking some two gallons of palm wine we are asking for 20 cows and that's it and usually in our system we are looking at marriages that have got to do with a man and a woman as a stance now mm -hmm. so yes it's according to the customary area from which the woman hails because they will give their list and it will be performed according to so once families have sat what they have asked for has been presented, has been accepted. The two involved are of marriage age, mm. I'll say, for that is important to the law. Very we important. are not looking at minors mm. going into marriage, mm. no. So once those two, and there is consent between the two, and the families have come together and have agreed and taken those things, what we see wearing the kente and all the euphoria these days we've created around mm. it, mm. that is actually marriage. Mm. So first, type of marriage customer marriage mm. and that is duly recognized and interestingly that can be registered as well mm. so if you're not sure and you feel that I've been married and a custom but I want something to be able to present I'm going to the embassy I am traveling yes you can actually register customary marriage and have a certificate of registration mm. which will be evidence of the fact that indeed you are married all right now we also have another type of marriage which we call the marriage of the Muhammadan. So we are looking at Islamic marriages. Right. 
that is also very much recognized in our jurisdiction here in Ghana. So we are looking at marriage according to Mohammedan law or according to Islamic principles and law. Now, the only thing required under our laws when it comes to Mohammedan marriage is that it must be registered within a week mm -hmm. after the marriage is celebrated. Now, the position of the law on the Mohammedan marriage is simply that if you do not register, then that marriage is not valid mm -hmm. to the extent that it's not registered. So then we've seen questions coming up where people feel that the law is harsh when it comes to the Mohammedan. But our courts have looked at it. The fact that we say that registration does not make it valid does not also mean that when there is an issue, we want to recognize legally that there is a marriage. Mm. We will, the courts will recognize indeed that this is marriage, except that we will recognize it as customary law, marriage. Mm. As but marriage also, and so, Sorry to interject, um, with regards to this particular marriage, mm. you're supposed to register within a week after the ceremony. Yes. Now, what if I'm unable to register after a week and maybe a week and a day, mm. I decide the day after that week to register the marriage. Does it render it invalid? No. You were able to go for a court order mm. to get it registered. Right. You only present a motion and state reasons why you could be sick. I mean, there are genuine reasons. You could right. have even right. done this elsewhere, not within the jurisdiction, yes. Mm. So you were able to come in. There is leeway for you to be able to have the order and go back and register. Mm. But what is important for me is if it's not registered, it doesn't mean we won't recognize the union. It will be recognized as a customary marriage. Mm. So there will still be marriage. So, but we will see it as a customary one. Now, the difference is this. If it is registered, what it means then is that if it comes to issues of inheritance, intestacy, or we, Islamic law will apply. Right. So once there is the registration, yes, it gives room for the Islamic law mm -hmm. to be fully applied. Mm -hmm. But once you haven't registered and those issues come up, yes, we'll recognize the marriage, but as a customary one. Mm -hmm. So that means then we are looking at the custom of the woman, mm -hmm. where they hailed from, the things that were taken. So we'll look at it as a customary one. Then the third type of marriage that is recognized, we call it the Christian and other monogamous marriages. Mm -hmm. Now, if you ask me, this is quite common, <laughs> which we all do in the name of wedding, wedding, wedding. So everybody believes that you have to be wedded to have a proper marriage. But I believe that by now we understand that our customary marriages are also very much valid. Well, yes. Yeah. I think uh, in recent times, the white weddings have been embedded in the customary one that after blessing or after exchanging or presenting the diary, to the families, the, they just do the white one. Everything. You know, everything together. Yeah. They've merged it. Yeah. A cocktail of marriage. Yeah. So <laughs> there is some explanation to this that we also need to appreciate. Mm. Nobody is able to marry twice. So for us lawyers, we understand what has happened is not a double marriage. Mm -hmm. Rather, we call it a conversion. So once you've taken the family things, we've won the kente, we are looking offline. And then we've decided to go to sign or enter the church and we have actually signed that certificate. Mm. Then what we've only done is to convert our customary marriage to a monogamous marriage. Now, the difference is this. Customary marriage and marriage of the Mohammedan is potentially polygamous. Now, what it means is that the man is able to marry more than one woman. Mm. Under Mohammedan law, because of Islamic laws, the cap is four. But under customary law, there is no cap. Mm, no so the man is able to marry, even if he wants to marry 20 women. Now, the third type which we recognize, which is the Christian and monogamous, is strictly one man, one woman. So I always say, particularly to the men, that you would want to consider the implications of the type of marriage you're contracting. Mm. And for you, the woman, too, you must understand the implications. So except for monogamous marriages, all other marriages recognized in Ghana are potentially polygamous. Mm. So the man is able to marry more than one woman. 
and under the monogamous, the man can only stick to one woman. Yeah. Interesting. Mm -hmm. Very, very, very interesting. Yes. So, like, for the avoidance of polygamy, people would rather do the... Yes. Um, I thought it was the ordinance something. Yes. Mm -hmm. Now, the name ordinance, because, yes, I mean, that's how we used to call it, Cap 127. Mm -hmm. Now, interestingly, we've merged all the marriage laws. They've right. been consolidated into what we call the Marriages Act. Act right. But at um, Christian marriages, the monogamous used to be Cap 127 only, mm -hmm. and the Mohammedan was Cap 129. Mm -hmm. Yes. But now they are together in one act called the Marriages Act. Right. And even with the monogamous, I say, even though we are contracting that more easily these days, mm -hmm. the truth is that people need to understand Monogamous marriages are not for Christians only, no. So if you choose, even as a Muslim, to want to have, to decide, and I've seen a few do it in recent times, that they, the parties have agreed, I want to stick to you only. They go ahead and they do that. Now, when it comes to the monogamous marriage, one man, one woman, we have what we do in the church, which we consider the Christian marriage. Mm -hmm. The way to celebrate it is important or that marriage will be voidable. And for me, that is important. Because if you're celebrating those marriage in a church and your clear intention is to have a monogamous under marriage under the laws of Ghana, mm -hmm. you have to be sure that your place of worship where you are signing is gazetted by the government of Ghana right. as a place gazetted for marriages. Mm -hmm. Whoever is officiating that marriage and signing that certificate as a minister should also have been gazetted and appointed a marriage officer by the government of Ghana. These two are very important. Or what you've done actually is only a semblance of a monogamous marriage. Your intentions are in your head, but that marriage is voidable. Voidable because it will only be valid until somebody has challenged it. Mm. Yes. Now, you can have the same monogamous marriage under what we call the registrar's certificate, which is what you see us do in the district assemblies. Yes. In the signing. In the courts. Mm. Yes. So there is no pastor. But those people have been legally appointed in our laws as marriage registrars. Mm. What we see in the church is the priest. We call those marriage offices. Then we have another monogamous marriage you can celebrate under what we call the special license that is what you see people do in the garden mm -hmm. so those places are not gazetted but you could give you could be given a special license so the marriage registrar moves the marriage register to the location for you to sign so it's very important that you even understand how these marriages are celebrated and the implications mm -hmm. now another thing you need to understand under the law because it has conferred a certain status under the law issues of inheritance mm -hmm. come up very importantly and one very erroneous impression people have is that it's only when you've contracted an ordinance marriage right. that is a monogamous marriage the one with a green certificate that you stand to inherit something but no, when you look at our intestacy law, right. PNDC law 111, a spouse is a spouse. Mm. So once you are a spouse under these three marriages that are recognized, whatever is due a spouse will be given you. Now, you also need to understand that should I decide that I don't want this marriage anymore, how am I to dissolve the marriage will depend on the type of marriage you have contracted. Mm. So if you've contracted customary law, you will dissolve under customary law by the presentation of dreams but if you have done a monogamous marriage and are holding that green and white certificate you will have to go to the court now the courts have allowed room for some for customary marriages to also come to the court right. for proper dissolution because of issues of property settlement right yeah. right very very interesting we are still learning on 
how to prepare or preparing for the marriage and what to know we've learned from counselor perfect you know the personalities the skills that uh, you need to acquire in determining that oh this person is someone I can end up in the marriage with she also mentioned um, financial independence spiritual you know supremacy and all those things lawyer has also espoused the conversation between marriage and law the types of marriage and the implications you don't just go and stand somewhere exchange rings and say we are married no it doesn't work that way <laughs> you're still watching the couch with Amar Pratt I'm and I'm sitting in so now I'll, I'll move to Dr. Isaiah he said he said he doesn't want to be referred to as doctor <laughs> please explain with the aid of a dad <laughs> All right, so um, Dr. Isaiah is a medical scientist yeah. and he will help us understand what are some of the medical preparations that one has to put in place before they get married. Okay. So, um, I said earlier, marriage is a very interesting thing mm -hmm. and legally and uh, as Councillor Perfect has also said, I think we need to prepare very well. She made a statement that physically you must be fit mm. mentally you must be fit medically speaking we need some assurances that this marriage will not end up in any health condition that will be detrimental to you or your children so there are some certain screening tests that you must be able to undergo so first of all let me start with the infectious ones mm. so first of all nobody would like to marry someone who has an infectious disease which is likely to be transmissible to you and the children. Mm -hmm. I, I don't think it will be that pleasant. Mm -hmm. So since a marriage is an enjoyment process or it's something that is very pleasurable, we would like to make sure that we do not take any kind of condition that will, will bring about sadness. So first of all, let's talk about these tests. Um, talking about, for example, HIV. So we may have to go screen for HIV, syphilis, gonorrhea. These are easily transmissible. Mm -hmm. And if care is not taken and not well treated, you could transmit it to your children and your spouse as well. Now, apart from the transmissible ones, we also have the genetic ones as well. So uh, we may have to go through some screening, HB genotype, which I'll talk about later. Um, HB genotype for you to know your HB genotype in the, ten, in the sense that are you actually liable to have sickle cell disease mm. you or your children or your your your, your offspring mm. are you like are you likely to have sickle cell disease are you likely to um, have a condition also called thalassemia which is also actually a genotype um, deficiencies here so are you likely to bring about any kind of conditions in this in in, in, in terms of your genetic makeup yeah, right. yeah that's very very important so sickle cell screening is also very very important in that sense now you may have to check your blood grouping now this attitude of blood grouping is very significant as well for the lady as especially mm -hmm. and for the man but of course when the woman conceives she needs to know this so that um in her treatment modalities these things will be taken into consideration mm -hmm. because you may need to know all these things. You also have to look at whether, generally speaking, mentally, as she said, mental health is also very important. So that even that your ability to be able to make decisions, rightful decisions, and your general health outlook, you should be able to be able to take care of yourself and take care of any other person who may come into the marriage. So generally speaking, you may need to know your blood group, your infectious um, transmissible diseases in terms of whether HIV, VDRL, that syphilis, or in terms of a gonorrhea or any other kind of disease condition that may come up with. Mm. And once you're able to clear all these things, I mean, we sh you should be able to enter into this marriage if you are satisfied with all these conditions. What about the fertility um, status of Very good. your... <laughs> Uh, your chosen one, yes, if I should say. It's, it's very important. So, mm. talking about fertility, then, of course, hormones actually play a role in fertility. So, with men and women, uh, when you're talking about fertility, then we are talking about things that will eventually um, lead to um, whether the person is going to be fertile or not. So, now, one most important thing is that the woman especially have to go through some hormonal 
investigations yes so that we get to know that in terms of everything per what we see the woman can conceive in terms of hormonal um, actions so for example luteinizing hormone mm -hmm. um, follicular stimulating hormone estrogen levels progesterone levels these things determine the fertility of women so far as her cycles are concerned mm -hmm. now for men too yes testosterone levels and your sperm count and all that these are also very very important mm -hmm. but you see most of the times the attitude of men going for premarital uh, health screening is actually very less because um, especially in ghana here we have the we have the notion that um, the woman is the one responsible for everything so far as fertility is concerned. Mm. So we may push the lady to go and do all the various tests and the man is likely not to do Consume anything at all. all the yes. weird <laughs> concoctions. <laughs> so, so virtually for the woman, the hormonal assays are very important. Mm. Yes, and for the man too, other hormonal, just like the woman, the testosterone levels in men, the sperm count in men also play a major role mm. in determining how fertile the man is likely to be after marriage right yes. very very interesting i think we've, we've learned so much here and um it has been established that you need to prepare before you go into marriage you know um so doc you know the the issue that arises whenever some of these tests are done is that um people are unable to uh you know cut ties because it's like We've gone through a journey mm -hmm. from talking stage, as we call it, to dating, to um, serious, committed relationship. And now we are preparing to marry. Now, if we run a test and my genotype is AS and my partner is AS, that means we are at risk of conceiving a child who is going to bring us um, ripple issues in the future. What do you say to these issues that when it gets to that point, people still overlook this red flag and move on? All right. That's very interesting. Um, but before I come to that, let me, let, let me actually start from here. You know, um, with the issue of the sickling issue, as you just said, someone being AS, AS, yes, you are likely to give birth to someone who has um, an SS, that is actually a sickle cell disease condition. Now, just a small highlight about this HB genotype mm -hmm. thing, which I want to just draw your mind to. You see, we have, basically we have A, whether you are HBA mm -hmm. or HBS or HB, we have another type called C. Actually, we have another type, two more types, D and E, mm -hmm. yes, which are not very common in our setting now. Mm -hmm. Now, with the HBA, which is regarded as the normal adult hemoglobin is likely i mean that is what we expect that ideally everybody should have so aa and you have as and you have um, ss then you have ac as well these are the most common ones here now with the question you asked now medically speaking when we get to a point where someone is having as as and are likely to give birth to an ss mm. all that we can advise is explain the potential risk of what the person is likely to go through mm. to the couple actually we advise that these tests be done earlier enough to avoid further emotional complications mm. so as early as possible these tests should be done so that these decisions that are very hard to take will not be taken at a later time right. which can actually affect the entire yeah, being marriage, yeah. yeah so you we may have to take this as early as possible right. so that we can avoid any further complications mm. yes so um we we've, we've talked about the uh, sickle cell yes. what, you call that hb hemoglobin yes yes okay and then we've also talked about the um transferable or communicable no com not communicable transmissible, transmissible disease or diseases, infectious diseases yes or infectious diseases and we've also spoken about the fertility yes. test apart from all these is there any other medical um so generally speaking of course we may need to look at um, predisposing factors mm. for example my family may have a history of diabetes mm. hypertension mm. the same for the woman mm. You see, these things are not necessarily like you are going to also contract uh, them as well. Them, yes. But 
at least it helps you to be very careful right. so that you do not because you, you know are like getting yourself into exactly mm. because once you also told that line of um, the things that may actually lead you to hypertension and right. diabetes right. your children may also have an increased risk at all right. especially for the woman for example if i have gestational diabetes right. the likelihood that my child will be diabetic at a very early age will be very high mm. so it helps us to be careful, take care of our health and everything. Of course, the woman goes through a lot of antenatal screenings when she's pregnant and all that. But before that, once I know that I have a history of diabetes and hypertension in my family, I should be extra careful with what I do to avoid these conditions in my family mm -hmm. or my future family, if I should put it that way. Well, yes. This has been a wholesome discussion on preparing for marriage here on the couch with Amar Pratt. I'm sitting in for her again. <laughs> and it's been exciting. It's been educative. This is where education and growth lives because we tend to learn a lot and we apply it to make ourselves better. Counselor Perfect, uh, what can you um, generally, uh, what kind of advice should we receive from you as a marriage counselor? to those of us who are preparing to get married to so those of, who are, of us who are looking forward to wearing the glamorous dress and you know should i say as antifoni beka said me to my bo bidiano ah yeah marriage is a long journey as people say so what advice do you have for us i'll say come to marriage link mm. you see we are talking about the law aspect. We are talking about the <coughs> medical, um, medical aspect, aspect yes. the legal. So when it comes to marriage link, it's a one shop, um, stop shop. Mm -hmm. You come, you get all these knowledgeable people to help you. Mm -hmm. So it's not faith based. If we are a Muslim, you want to get married, you don't know the type. You don't want your husband to add under three wives, and your husband also agrees. Come and let our lawyer legal expert lawyer and he help you to know the type of marriage that will best for you and even when things happen you see in marriages there are two things involved is either death or there are three things involved is either death um divorce or cheating one one of these will happen to you inevitable in, in, yes <laughs> one so we just pray that maybe it's a dead aspect you grow old and one live mm yes or you get divorced along the way maybe it's not your fault maybe it's also your fault mm. and maybe you'll be cheated on but if these three things or happen or you cheat and when these three things happen you need a lawyer by your side mm. to guide you what to do so you need to come to marriage link and if you are preparing to get married, doctor was talking about the AS, the general type, was saying a lot of things, some big terms. Mm. You need to come there so that you can run all these tests and a doctor explains things to you. Not just you do the test and you just go. Mm. Explain things to you that this is what you'll be facing. So this, the, this and this is how you have to do it. So when you talk about marriage link, we are talking about we preparing you. We do four things. We match make you, we prepare you, we reduce up when you get married to reduce up we also have events mm. that we do but for our match making we have always been saying that we realize that a lot of people are matured of legal age they are working they want to settle down they don't have the time doing three years four years to get a partner and later realize that their genotype doesn't match and all that so when it comes to our place all this is being handled so it's a, when you come, everything is there. The legal aspect, the psychological aspect will prepare you to marry. So when you get married, it's not like 50-50. I'm going to try and come. Mm. As you said, I want to come. So get mm. prepared. Know what you are stepping into. Mm. And know that this is what I'm going to, I, I'm facing. This This is the partner I'm going to handle. These are his short thoughts. And I'm willing to work to make things work. Because marriage is, with, as I said, two imperfect people. But marriage can work if we accept that we make it work. Any 
marriage can work if you accept that i'll make it work if the husband accept that i'll make it work if the wife also accept that i'll make it work it works because i'm going to put you um i'm going to put you ahead you're also going to put me ahead and at the end we are going to be happy making you happy you to, you to making me happy makes a happy marriage mm -hmm. so come to marriage link consult and what we say is that when it comes to marriage link we have counselors we have all that you need we That's are right. just at um pan africa when you come here they will direct you to yeah. where we are we will definitely we will even <laughs> hold your hand and take you there <laughs> yeah and our numbers is scrolling so yeah. just pick it call we'll take us. your hand and take you there uh, it's been an insightful conversation this is the show you shouldn't miss because uh people are ignorant about the fact that you need to prepare before getting yourself into marriage. Now, I'm going to give our panelists, um, let me see, one, two, three, four, five, uh, 10 seconds each to say something. Quickly, quickly. Okay, so I'll start with you, lawyer, Annie. Okay, so I'll say that in as much as you're preparing for the ceremony and the glam that comes with it, it's even more important to prepare for the lifelong journey mm. that starts after. So we are actually stretching out our hand as marriage link. For me, I'll say that it's the first of its kind in Ghana. Mm. And so we invite everybody right. that come in, have legal education, right. have psychological education, right. have medical education, mm. and actually have spiritual, depending on your faith yeah. also, so that you can make a holistic preparation so for the journey ahead. Yeah. Right. Right. All right. So I move to you, Doc. All right. Because our perfect has said everything. <laughs> yeah. So I think um, once you are uh, contemplating marriage, you should be able to undergo intensive health screening so that you can ascertain the fact that what you are going in will not bring any problem to you. So I talk about the HB genotype, a test called the HB electrophoresis is done. And almost all the other things, just a simple blood test can help you know everything. So just walk in. And once you come and we refer you to the various laboratories for you to go your, do your investigations, we have time, interpret everything for you, and then the further advice is given to that extent to avoid any complications in the future. Very well. Yeah. Thank you so much. Loyami, thank you so much for coming. I like the way you speak. I'll speak like you when I grow up. And uh, Councillor Perfect, always, always, we appreciate your time and your presence here. And Dr. Isaiah, thank you, thank you so, so, <laughs> so much. much. And thank you for always choosing to watch this show and keep yourself informed and make informed choices. We've looked at uh, the three dimensions when it comes to preparing for my social psychological aspect. We've also look at, looked at the legal aspect and also the um, medical aspect. We want to say a big thank you to you and many thanks to Amar Fas for giving me the opportunity to sit in for her and also to our crew. You're always doing an amazing job. Thank you. See you same time next week. Goodbye. African.